Psalm 67. My God, I, I've enjoyed the messages today, Pastor Carr this morning, and, and Pastor French, uh, Evangelist French this afternoon. He's on the pulpit with us. For you who are not here, he's on his way to Russia and uh, ministered very especially to my heart and to many, many others. And God moved in a very special way. And thank you, my brother, for sharing God's heart. That was a prophetic, very strong prophetic word. Lord, I need you. And we need hearing ears to hear what you have to say to us tonight. Lord, the anointing is not measured in how loud we speak. It's not measured in the steps I take on this platform. It's measured by your word and how it touches our hearts and how the Holy Spirit drives it and marks us. Sanctify me purge me, and let me speak as the oracle of God tonight. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your precious living word that is so encourages today. Now again tonight, speak to us, I pray. Lord, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you that we have all power of the enemy, absolute power of the enemy. We take that authority, the authority of Jesus Christ in his name, over all the powers of the enemy in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's read it, and then I'll get to preaching. God, be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, that thy way may be known upon earth, the saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. But notice verse 6. Then shall the earth yield her increase. We're going to find out when then is and how it comes about. Hallelujah. Now, beloved, according to Acts 1.8, Every single person who is baptized of the Holy Ghost, every single believer that can say, I am filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm walking with the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Ghost, you have been appointed by God to be a missionary. Like it or not, you are an appointed missionary. You shall be, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses. It doesn't say you ought to be witnesses. You shall be witnesses. That's a command. You shall be witnesses unto me, even unto the uttermost part of the earth. <clears throat> now, folks, we're living in a shrunken world. It's shrinking more and more every day. You can get on an airplane now and go to any spot in the world within one day, and where it took six months at a time, at, at one time, uh, not too long ago, less than a hundred years ago, it would take six months to go to China. You can go there now in, a, in, in just a number of hours by jet. So we have a shrinking world. <clears throat> Here in New York City, entire nations are represented in one apartment house. Do you realize there, there is one apartment complex here in New York that has 60,000 people? That's as many as in some cities. In one apartment complex, one great big apartment complex, many of them have 10, 15,000. You know, people say, well, uh, it, it, what size church you had? Folks, even if we had 10,000 in this congregation on a Sunday morning, that's one apartment building in some areas. That's one complex. But in my complex where I live a block from here, there's probably every nation in the world represented. They're on, they're on my elevator. They're in the subway. They're everywhere. Russians by the thousands pouring into Brooklyn now. And from Hong Kong, they're, 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 they're believing there'll be forty to 50,000 in just a month's time, in one month's time coming from Hong Kong, now that Hong Kong is going over to the communist. Uh, right in this church, uh, it's been estimated between 60 and 70 different nationalities. We have uh, people from every nation in Africa. You know, uh, just by sending people home, this could be the biggest missionary church on the face of the earth. <laughs> but I want to build a fire on you tonight by the Holy Ghost, God willing, and make you see that you and I have no choice in this matter. God gave you the Holy Ghost not to play with gifts, 
God didn't give you the Holy Ghost to go to some place and get a blessing and fall down on the floor and giggle. And then get up and say, well, I've got that power. I'm going to make everybody else go out and do the same thing. I'm not making fun. But I'm sick and tired of people saying, well, I, I, I went a thousand miles and I got so happy. I fell down. And one man wrote to me this past week, Friday, he said, now I've got the gift and I'm going around making people laugh all over. Everywhere I go, people are laughing because I'm laying hands on them. And it makes me want to cry. And... I'm told this is the greatest move of God in the United States and around the world right now. Is this it to fall on the floor and then go around testify? I feel great. I feel wonderful. My God said, ye shall be my witnesses. And he said, you're going to start where you're at and you're going to go to the uttermost part of the world. And the utter po uttermost parts of the world have come to our doorstep. They're right here in New York City. We have Chinese, uh, we have Chinatown here, we've got little Italy, we've got Harlem, we've got name it, we have it. Port Puerto Rico, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, we would never miss you, Angelo. This world is never going to be evangelized if we leave missions the old denominational methods. Never. Because you're going to have, if you're going to be a missionary with any major Pentecostal organization, for example, you're going to go to three to five years of school. Then you're going to go to a graduate mission school. And then you're going to itinerate for a year to raise thousands of dollars. You're going to have to have a vehicle. You're going to have to have a PA system. You're going to have to have the literature. And you're going to have to be uh, taking in thirty-five to $50,000 a year to support yourself on a mission field. And folks, that is going to take forever. And that's just a handful. Thank God for every one of them to go. We pray for them. We send them out of this church the same way. But then there's the mailing list and, and, and the computer. You know, you've got to have an awful lot of money to be a missionary with any denomination today. We're never going to win the world. We're never going to evangelize. It's never going to get done. Let me talk to you about foreign missions for just a minute and, and what I feel burning in my heart. What about literally millions of so-called Christians that are vacationing now all over the world? What about uh, all the Christians now that are going backpacking in Mongolia? What about all of these special trips now through the Sahara? They, they've got four-wheelers now, and they're going to see how far their four-wheelers would take them. And they're camping in the Sahara all through Africa. What about the thousands of Christians that are going now to Egypt and to Spain and Israel and all over the world now? We've got Christians with money and Christians who pray filled with the Holy Ghost covering the whole face of the earth. Go to Kennedy Airport and, and look at the multitudes leaving Kennedy Airport going all over the face of the earth. Christians. They've got Bibles. And I'm saying that every one of them have been called as missionaries. Vacation or no vacation, they are missionaries. Every businessman covering the earth, trying to sell his products. He is not just a businessman. If he knows Jesus, he's a missionary. And you living here in America, what are you? Are you a lawyer? Are you a dentist? Uh, do you, uh, are you a clerk in a store? Are you a maid? Uh, uh, do you push a broom? What do you do? It matters not what you do. You're a missionary. Now, I believe God wants to turn you today, turn your thinking around and show you that you have been called to be a missionary and you don't have to have a portfolio of, of homiletically correct sermons. You don't have had to, you don't have had to, you, you, there's no need for you to have graduated from some college. You don't have to have $3,000 for a TWA ticket to any portion of the face of the earth. You don't need all kinds of support. You are a missionary here and now where you are in your business, in your work. You are a missionary. If you have the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something. Being a gifted preacher, evangelist or teacher doesn't make you a missionary. Having gifts of healing 
Prophecy, discernment, doesn't make you a missionary. There are many great teachers and preachers that I've sat under. And my, they can open the Word of God. I've been in meetings with some mighty faith preachers who were really strong. I've seen miracles. I've worked with some, uh, I've ministered with some of the most famous healing evangelists on the face of the earth. And I've seen people get out of wheelchairs. I've seen blinded eyes open as they've, they've prayed for them. And I've sat under teachers that just threw me. They can open the Word of God. But folks, I'm telling you that without character, they are nothing. You hear teachers, they, they can come to this platform, they can come to any platform, and they can, they can sound so good, they can sound so powerful in the Word of God, you say, they have to be holy because how could anybody know the Word of God and open it like that unless they were really walking close to Jesus? And then some of the advances that have fallen, it blew some people away and you cried for weeks because you couldn't understand how such strong preachers could, could, could fall down. First of all, anyone, any preacher who was made an idol or accepted idolatry, God brought him down because of that. Because you'll have no idols before him. But you see, the Bible says, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels. In other words, speak as profoundly as an angel. Who could speak more profoundly than an angel? That's been there and seen it and tasted it and, and has walked the portals of glory and been at the throne. He, he says, though I talk with the language of an angel and have not charity I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains now that's something to move mountains here's something that you can have all knowledge you can have all prophecy all discernment but if I don't have a heart of character, if I don't have the love of Jesus Christ in my heart, if I am not a man or if you're not a woman of character, the Lord said it's just brass. It's nothing. You're nothing. Nothing. Because you have no character behind it. Without character, <clears throat> that great healer who raises the cripples, knows wheelchair, out of wheelchairs, he's nothing. He's not a missionary. And folks, we get this all wrong. We, 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 we have missionaries come to us. And we, I, I know when I pastored for years in a little town in Pennsylvania, uh, we have missionaries come. And the only time that people were stirred on, uh, is when the missionary would come and could tell the best sob stories about little children starving and everything. And everybody got all excited for two weeks. I, I was, I got more excited than anybody. Every time a missionary came, I put my watch, I put my ring, everything went in the, in the, in the offering basket. It was all emotional. And we get all excited, but folks, God wants you to be a missionary not because you're mostly moved, but because you're understanding what the Word of God says about it. It's an understanding of the, of the living Word of God. <clears throat> You see, we, we, we don't figure this out. You, you listen to men that come and deliver the word of God, and because it so thrills you and it's so profound and so direct, you say, this man has really got to be something. When I'll tell you the truth, little babies in Christ get more revelation than most profound preachers, because he said he'd reveal himself to babes. And I'll tell you what, down at our Bible school in Pennsylvania, they're going to be here, I think, in two weeks. The Bible school is going to be here, at our Mount Zion Bible College. And I'll tell you, there's a 21-year-old preacher who's going to be preaching here, a little, little black boy, and there's another kid, he's about 25 years old. And I'll tell you, I want to sit down there, and I want to cry, because I said, Lord, I've been preaching, studying all these years, he's 21, how does he get such revelation? Lord, I didn't see that. I've been studying that passage for years. I didn't see any of that. He's revealing himself to babies who have just nothing but faith and sense of their character. They have a heart for God and they're getting the revelation. They don't preach sermons. They preach Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Psalm 67 is all about how to become a God-blessed, powerful missionary right where you live. Now, in verse 1, 
the Lord plainly outlines three things that are necessary to produce a powerful missionary. There are three things. And I want you to look at verse 2. That thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Look at me, please. Listen to how profound, listen to how direct, how plain that is. God's saying there is a way that my ways can be known to all nations and all people, and my saving health, my saving healing power can be known to the whole world. Read it again. That thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Well, what is, what is it he's talking about? Three lines. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. The three characteristics that mark a true Holy Ghost filled powerful missionary. Now let's pray God open this up to us now if you will. God's saying, here's a plan, here's a way that we can touch the whole world. This is a way to witness to all the people here in New York City to demonstrate his healing, saving power. <clears throat> it all comes down to this very thing. The world, God says, the world's going to learn my ways. They're going to understand my healing power. But it's going to be not by some knowledge you've learned at school or college or a missions program. It's something that I've taught you by the Holy Ghost. All right. <clears throat> Psalms 67 verse 1 is the prayer God is having us pray in order to evangelize our people around us and the nations of the world. <clears throat> this is the prayer that we should be praying. And once we come into the power of that prayer and the Holy Ghost reveals <clears throat> what he's saying to us, it should change us. I know it's affecting me. <clears throat> verse one, God be merciful unto us. That's characteristic number one of the world's most powerful missionaries. Listen to it. God be merciful unto us. Now, look at me, please. The number one characteristic of a true missionary is mercifulness. I'll say it again. You cannot be a Holy Ghost missionary you can't be a witness unless you have tasted, you know, and understand, and practice, and live the mercy of God. The absolute mercy of God. With the merciful, thou will show thyself merciful. Second Samuel twenty-two twenty-six. 26. What that really means is when you are truly thankful for his mercy that he's shown you, you're going to show that same mercy to the world. Folks, any one of us, I've been a prophetic preacher for years and I've preached judgment for at least 18 years now. And there are judgment preachers all over the nation. There are Christians here that know that judgment is coming. And you, you can read through Jeremiah and all the prophets and your heart burns because you feel as the prophets do because there's some kind of a prophetic stream in you and you know the judgments of God are coming. And many of you who read the word and, and you are saturated with this word, you know that no society can go on like ours without judgment. You've seen how God has moved against the Roman and the Grecian Empire, Sodom and Gomorrah, and all of Israel when they sinned against God. And you know we've reached that point. And you cry out to your friends. Folks, I have thundered judgment from pulpits all over the world. I've written book after book about it. And I have thundered judgment and I have read the prophets. Folks, there have been times I've taken months and just saturated myself with the prophets. But we must never forget that in judgment God remembers mercy. He came to save, not to destroy. I want you to listen to Moses. Here's a man who can thunder this awesome phrase. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. Your God's jealous. He's a jealous God. He thundered at Israel. But in the very same sermon, he said in the latter days, when you were in tribulation and all these things are coming upon you, if you will turn to the Lord thy God, be obedient unto him. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither will he destroy thee. This man knew the judgments of God. 
But I'm going to make a statement and I want you to hear it good. No man, no Christian, no preacher, a judgment preacher, a Christian who knows the judgment of God, no Christian who knows the judgments of God has a right to say one word about judgment until he knows the mercy of God. You have no right to say one word or preach one word to anyone about judgment until you know his mercy. You've tasted it. You've experienced it. You're convinced and persuaded God is merciful. Joe, a judgment preacher, first established his heart in the knowledge of mercy. And it was Joe who said, for he is gracious and he's merciful. He's slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. He said, God's real intention is, is to change his mind. God would really like to, 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 to change this. It's, it's, it's not that, that God wants to destroy the earth. God is calm as a merciful God and he'd like to change his mind if you repent. Hallelujah. I want you to go to Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, please. Nehemiah. Ne Nehemiah came to warn the backslidden Israelites of God's judgment and to rebuild. And in the ninth chapter, beloved, listen to me. You can't, you can't find a single Old Testament prophet who preached judgment, who didn't have the fullest revelation of his mercy. These were merciful men. These were mercy preachers. Verse 16, chapter 9. But then there our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. They refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst amongst them. Amongst them but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf, and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt, and had wrought great provocations. Folks, that's one of the worst provocations in all the Bible, to, to, to build a stupid idol out of their earrings. To anybody, anybody be so stupid as to think their earrings were God. The utter stupidity and blindness. Verse 19, yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not. In the wilderness the pillar of the fire and cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way. Neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light the way when they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. With You held, withheld not thy manna from their mouth. You gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you did sustain them in the wilderness, so they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old. Their feet swelled not. Verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient, rebelled against thee, and cast the law behind their backs. They slew the prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. Folks, you see the... The, the wickedness of this people. Therefore thou deliverest them in the hand of their enemies who vexed them in the time of their trouble. When they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again. These people, how do you... They're just like us. It, it, it's discouraging. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore, leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercy. In fact, you go the rest of the chapter, it's getting a little repetitious. At the, in verse 50, uh, verse 31, Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, Thou did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Beloved, I don't know if I'm going to be able to express this the way I feel God wants me to. God, help me. Let me speak to everyone hearing me right now who's tasted of the mercy of God. Drug addict, alcoholic, prostitute. Not just you, but everyone in this building. The day God stooped down into your awful condition. 
He stooped down in His mercy. He saved you. He opened your eyes. He came down when you were hopeless, when you blasphemed, when you were nothing in the sight of God. You were a stranger and an alien. You had no time for Him. And in His mercy, He stooped down in His great tender compassion. And He revealed His mercy to you. He did it for a reason. To make you an example, a pattern of His mercy, that you could be a missionary of mercy to the whole world. Paul said, How be it for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on Him to life eternal. Beloved, there's a tragedy in the church, and it grieves me. Some of the hardest preachers I know, some of the most bitter, critical Christians I know, those who have no mercy on other people are those who have tasted the greatest mercy of God themselves, who have been saved from the pits of hell, who, who were reprobates in their minds and God's forgiven them and they become holier than thou, have no mercy toward anybody. I know preachers like that. I, I, I had a wife come to me and she said, oh, my, my husband's known as a holiness preacher all over the United States, but try living with the man. He's a devil. Gets up and preaches these big sermons on holiness and he has no Christian character. And that man had been delivered from all kinds, from pornography and everything else. He had great mercy. He should have been exposed. He should have, he was a devil headed for hell and the Lord forgave him. But there was no mercy in his preaching. Are you willing for the same Christ who gave you mercy to show it to all of these reprobates around you in your apartment and where you work? Are you willing for the Lord to come down and stoop down in the awful condition of that boss of yours who abuses you? What about all the abortion doctors? Are we going to shoot them all? The Lord said, you don't even know what spirit you're of. That's not my spirit. That's not my spirit. Are you willing that the, these 250, 300,000 act up homosexuals and these uh, uh, homosexuals who are uh, parading around this city, are, are you willing that even though they parade down those wicked streets in, the, in, in, in nakedness and, and shake their fist at God and, and signs Jesus is gay, are, are you willing to pray, oh Jesus, they're miserable as I was. These people can't sleep. Oh God, you showed me mercy. Show mercy. That's what this is saying. Be merciful unto us that we may show mercy. Give us a revelation of your mercy so that we can go out and be merciful to others. A number of years ago, God told me I couldn't preach judgment anymore until I learned mercy. I, I, there are some of my old tapes I've had to turn off. I can't listen to. Because I didn't understand his mercy. And when he revealed it to me, I told him I would never preach judgment without ending with mercy. And I've, by God's grace, he's helped me. Are you willing for that unsaved husband of yours who fights you and gives you all kinds of trouble and those around you who have abused you? Are, are you willing to pray, oh God... <laughs> I'm no better. I am no better. I was just like that or worse. And you came down. Do you remember when you couldn't sleep? Do you remember the hell you lived in? Do you remember all of that weight that's upon you? When you woke up in the morning, you wish it was night and night, you wish it was day. And now that's been relieved. Have you forgotten the pit from which you were dug? Oh, you pro oh God. Let me show the world mercy as you've shown it unto me. Secondly, the prayer is, and bless us. Now, in the Old Testament, God's blessings were determined primarily by material things. Their cattle were blessed so that their cattle gave off their young without the young dying. The, the land and the vineyards were prospered. They were given houses and lands and fullness of bread. 
that the whole world, because the world in Israel's time judged God's uh, reality, or that there was a God by His blessing the land, sending rain and and that there were no famines, and that the people were blessed. Anybody was blessed had a God, a true God. And God blessed Israel above anyone on the face of the earth, and you you can read it. For the Lord thy God, Deuteronomy 2, 7, hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And what... Uh, Moses is preaching here is that you've been blessed and that God is with you to meet every one of your needs. He's giving you manna. He's giving you water to drink. He's, he's taking care of your shoes so, so that they, they, they didn't wear out and your clothes didn't wear out. And, and this was obvious to the whole world. And they say there is a God. God takes care of this people. And the blessings were material. We've got a lot of people want to go back to that Old Testament covenant and live under that covenant. And they want a BMW. They want a Mercedes. They want all the blessings. They, God bless me so the whole world will know God's with me. <clears throat> I heard a preacher on, on radio once. He said, I drive a Rolls Royce and I live in a $500 house. Don't tell me God ain't with me. He said, everybody can see God's with me. Well, if that's the way you judge it, then uh, Mr. Hughes, who died as a multi-billionaire, I think were, what, there were three people at his funeral, died with a scraggly hair and long fingernails like an animal. <clears throat> no, you see, God has under the new covenant given us all these promises. I'll supply all your needs. He said, you seek me first, I'll take care of all these other things. You don't even have to pray. The Bible says, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the Bible said the Gentiles ask for these things. That's a Gentile, in other words, that's a heathen prayer. The heathen asked for that. And that's a heathen gospel that's being preached today. But the blessing that is ours, I'm going to read you a verse and show you what the scripture is saying here. And bless us. I want you to listen to it closely. Here's the blessing that we're to pray about. Acts 3.26 Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him... Why did God send Jesus? Sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Look at me. That is the blessing of these last days. That is the prayer we're to pray. God bless me by giving me confidence in the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. Jesus was sent to me that he may take all my bondage, take away all my sins, that I can walk around to my neighbors on the job, a free man, a free woman, and they can look at that testimony and say, there's a missionary. I've heard about preaching the resurrection. And I've got in my library whole commentaries on, on the mercy of God and on, uh, <clears throat> this matter of, of being, uh, sins forgiven. But you see, we have turned mercy into a cold, a legal transaction with God. It's cold. I have some of the old Puritan books. I have literally read 500 page books on the contract, the legal contract of God on grace and mercy. And it goes something like this. You confess your sins, you get sorry, you repent, and God is legally obligated to forgive you. And, and they go through all the legal arrangements with the legal language, and you can talk about propitiation, you can talk about sanctification, justification, you can talk about all the theological terms, and finally, I get weary of it because it's legal, I, it sounds like a lawyer is writing it, and I, I get, my mind gets so bogged down in the legal aspects of grace and mercy and love, and it's not that complicated. You see, the reality of this is very, very simple. 
The devil couldn't hold Jesus down. I'm talking about preaching the resurrection. You don't need a 500 page book. We have a loving heavenly father. That's what this message is all about. We have a loving heavenly father who doesn't want anybody to perish. So he sent his own son and God became flesh and came down to get into our awful condition, to feel it, to know it. To feel our hurt and feel our pain and our anxiety. God came down and lived as a man. He died taking our sins and he was resurrected. And let me tell you what preaching the resurrection means. The devil couldn't hold Jesus down. He can't hold me down. He couldn't hold Jesus in chains. He can't bind me. Jesus was raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father. I'm raised from the dead, seated right beside him. It's that simple. I have a Father who loves me, who relates to my pain, who says, you are free because I'm free. You don't have to give in to the devil his power because I broke it. I don't want a contract. I want a heart. It has to be an absolute confidence that you can trust Jesus to give you power over sin. Folks, if you don't have that, Pastor Carter's preached his heart on that. I've preached my heart on it. Pastor Don has preached his heart out on that. Listen to me. If the devil can just get you to fear evil, David says, I'll fear no evil. If the devil can just get you to believe and, and just have that little hint of doubt in your mind that you can't go out there and witness to people because you're not quite there yet. You can't witness to anybody because you failed him so many times. You can't witness because you still have this little nagging fear that somehow you're going to go back to some old habit and the devil is going to drag you down. Oh, when God is saying the prayer, cry out, oh God, bless me. Bless me. Nobody's, do you understand that yet? Lord, you sent Jesus to bless me. How? By turning away every one of us from our sins. He turns us. How many have been blessed to being turned away from your sins? How many have been blessed? I tell you, you go out in the street and you t go ahead and tell somebody how God gave you a BMW. You go out here and tell a drug addict how, how God, oh God has blessed me. Look at the nice clothes I've got. God blessed me. I got a home in Utah, uh, or Colorado. Utah, or Cal Colorado. Go out and tell him, I, I have a yacht in East River. You think he's going to be changed in his heart? You think I'm going to touch anything in his heart? But you go ahead and tell him. I was a drug addict. I was bound by sin. I was just like you. I had no hope. I was a poor, lost, hopeless beggar. Jesus came and delivered me from all my sins. You're going to touch him right where he lives. You're going to touch the nerve because there, believe it or not, even though they mock you or anything else, there's still, there's, there's, there's this desire. Oh God, there's, there's a cry. There's a heart cry. God, if you're there, like the boy, the drug guy that came, loaded up his, his needle. He's preaching the gospel today, but laid on his bed. Everyone had given up on him. And he stuck the needle in, got high, but sucked enough blood in it and pushed the needle and wrote on the ceiling, help God with his blood. Help. One drug addict so incensed, so desirous to get free, chained himself to 
one of those big iron uh, heat, what do you call those, radiators. And the second day, he got so needing of drugs, he couldn't break it, so he literally, in rage, pulled the whole radiator, walked down the street with an 80-pound radiator on his back. And he's one of our boys today. <laughs> A week from this coming Tuesday, we have in this pulpit Sonny Arkansoni preaching. First drug addict we won to the Lord years ago. A, a praying mother. Now he's a bishop of, of, uh, of churches, all of the United States drug addict churches. I'm preaching his convention this year. Last time I preached it, there were 13,000 converted drug addicts and alcoholics there at the meeting under a huge tent. 13,000. And I met him down under the elevated train in Brooklyn. He thought I was a narcotic agent. <laughs> but that boy had a praying mother. Filthiest boy you'd ever want to meet. We took him into our home. And I brought him home. It was the first, we lived in Staten Island. I'd never had a drug addict in our home, but didn't have a center at that time, so we took him in so he could kick a cold turkey. And for two days, watched him sweat and go through all this hell. Put all the cry in his heart. Oh, God, if you can deliver me. And I saw God come down to one of the worst junkies in New York and change his life. Show his mercy. And you're going to hear a preacher of mercy because God showed him mercy. And you know what? You, you know why there are thousands of drug addicts? He gets out in the street. He's still a street preacher. And, and, and you know why those drug addicts come by the thousands? <laughs> it's not some homiletical sermon. It's not some legal message. He's been blessed. He got the bless. I, I hear people talking about going to some city to get a blessing. <laughs> Folks, you've got the blessing if you have deliverance from sin. You've got the biggest blessing God's ever given you. I've been blessed. I've been set free. I'm free. I'm not an addict. I'm not bound. I'm free. Hallelujah. I'm not what I want to be yet, but I'm not what I was. And I'm on my path to total freedom. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell the world. Glory to Jesus. Now here in closing, and cause his face to shine on us. What happened to Moses when he was shut in for 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord, who is nothing but blazing glory? It lit up his face. The number one problem in American churches, we don't have enough people lit up. It lit up his face. I can't imagine a single sinner on the face of the earth wanting to get saved by looking at the countenance of many of God's people, even in this church. We have sourpuss Christians who've been complaining ever since they've been saved. They line up back here. Well, that'll do it. <laughs> now, I'm, that's maybe one out of three. Now, I got out of that nicely. All right. You, uh, beloved, in all sense, you know them. Every time you talk to them, how's it don't dare ask them how they're doing. Don't dare ask, how are you doing? Oh, man, I, I'm terrible. It's just awful. And, and you stand there an hour, and that's all you hear. You hear it pouring out of their heart. There is no sign of the face of Jesus that comes only through intimacy. You know, the apostles that were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, why didn't their face shine? If they'd been there 40 days, they would have. It's a matter of long quality time. Shut in. 
with the Lord. Philippians 2.15, that we may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, you can have these first two characteristics and not have the third. You can, you can know the mercy of God. He could have come down in your, in your wretched condition and changed you. You can have this blessing of your sins forgiven and still not have the shine of God's face. The children of Israel, the Bible says, Jezreel waxed fat. And you read how God blessed and he prospered. And yet they transgressed against him and therefore he had to hide his face from them. Ezekiel 39, 23. A blessed people who are still under the sacrifices. They were still making sin offerings to the Lord. Covered by sin offering. Prospered. But didn't have the favor of God didn't have the smile or the shine of God's face. You know what the shine of God's face is? It's the smile of God. It's, it's someone who says, I want to be a witness to the whole world. And it's something to see, by, as a brother preached this afternoon, so clearly, it's by faith, it's a decision. I'm not going to live as a crank anymore. I'm not going to live under the thumb of the devil. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm sick and tired of living like this. And you, you, you say, Lord Jesus, you have delivered me. You blessed me by setting me free from my sins. You have shown me mercy. Now, oh God, put the joy of the Lord in my heart. Give me faith and confidence that you're walking with me. And the smile of God is simply that God has turned his countenance toward you and says, I am with you. Don't ever fear again. It is the countenance, the favor, the blessing of God, the hand of God on you. I'll tell you what. It's taken all the fear out of my life. It's a promise he made me. Long time ago. As clear as anything I've ever heard in my life. He said, David, I put my hand upon you. You are enveloped in the glory of my hand. So you never, never have to fear. Didn't he say... We're inscribed in the palm of his hand. And what I saw was a, his hand as a glory cloud. And it just comes and it just envelops you. And you're in this glory cloud. And if you're in that glory cloud, you need to fear no man. You need to fear nothing. But the fear of God itself. God lights us up to show the world, to give testimonies that he's a God of rest. He's a God of peace. That he delivers. Uh, how much of the character of Jesus are you showing on the job? You know, you know what bothers me? We've got more and more Christians whose Jesus is getting smaller and devil getting bigger. One evangelist said his devil was 900 feet high. I wonder what size... Jesus was then. How big's your devil? My devil's been... <laughs> Would you look at verse 3, 4, and 5? Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Folks, is, he's talking about how to evangelize the world. How to evangelize New York. Folks, uh, this is a house of joy because where there's repentance, there's joy. And I'm going to close now. But listen to me, please. You've got to understand that. Why is God giving us joy? Why is he putting songs of praises on a list? Why is there such happiness, joy in this house? So we can take it, the whole world can see that. And you don't just have it here. It's born out of a peace and a rest and a calm because you know everything is under the blood. And Jesus is victor over all the powers of the enemy. God has blessed you with mercy, forgiveness of sins. Now he wants you to shout and rejoice and let the whole world, let nobody, nobody take your joy. Let nobody take your joy. Sad. Bless you, Jesus.
I've determined that no man on the face of this earth is going to rob me of my joy and my rest in Him. Because I know I've got a loving Heavenly Father. Do you fellas know that? you have a loving Heavenly Father? Choir, do you know that? You've got a loving Heavenly Father? Amen. If you just know He loves you, if you just know that and receive it, it'll take you through any storm. We can try to present what burns so hard in our, our spirits. and You just have to take our our puny efforts and and make something out of it, Lord. Take the few loaves and fishes and multiply it now. Make it meat to our souls and life to our joints. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.